day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you've done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. You will desire, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Now I'll be reading from Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Um, verse 17 to 25. So I hated life, because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all things I had toiled for under the sun, because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish? Yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I've poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For a person may labor with wisdom, knowledge and skill. And then they must leave all they own to another who has not toiled for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? All their days their work is grief and pain. Even at night their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too I seize from the hand of God, for without him who can eat or find enjoyment? This is the word of the Lord. Well, let's pray together and then we'll think a little bit about what it means to work in a broken world. Let's pray. Lord, we pray now that you would open your word to us and that you would open us to your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we began this little mini holiday series thinking about what it means to work well as God's people. Uh, and as I said, it's a really important subject because work is so dominating in our lives. We spend so much of our life working, and so we really need to think Christianly about the topic of work. And what we saw last week is that work originates in God himself. Work is good intrinsically because it comes from God. We saw that God is the ultimate worker who never stops creating and providing and sustaining, and that he has a good design for all of our work as well, that there is purpose to it. 
Not only that, but as we go about the work that God has given us, we can uh, kind of partner with God in what He is doing in this world by filling and, and forming and subduing all that God has placed in our uh, influence. And so God has called us to work to His glory for the good of others and according to whatever calling God has placed on our lives. Now, it's really important that we're clear on those things before we move on today. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to listen to last week's message, maybe go and have a listen to it. But we do need to say more. Because my guess is, if you were here last week, this week wasn't just plain sailing, uh, rainbows and unicorns for you, right? There were, there were some tough times. And you may have looked back on the message and say, wait a minute, maybe he's living on a different planet because my work is not exactly like that. This morning, I want to think about why that is. Why is it that work actually is so hard and difficult and filled with unmet hopes and dreams. And of course, there is a good reason for it. And uh, what we see this morning is that this world is under a curse. It's under God's curse. It's under His judgment. And to find out where it all went wrong, we need to go back to Genesis chapter 3. And this morning, then, I want to look at this uh, topic under two headings, work in a broken world and working well in a broken world. So firstly, let's understand work in a broken world. And going back to that passage in Genesis 3 is really important, the one that was read for us. Uh, that's the moment, of course, when everything unravels. That's when Adam and Eve decide to make a declaration of autonomy. And instead of living under God's rule and his authority, they decide they're going to be their own kings, their own bosses, and live for themselves. That's really what the, the, the fruit incident is all about. It's got nothing to do with fruit, really. It's about authority, and it's about submission. And God says, if you refuse to live in obedience to my word, you will have to pay the consequences for that. And so what we discover is a whole bunch of effects or consequences or fallout from their rebellion against God. We see a world that comes under his judgment. And so from that moment on, evil and sin and suffering and death become part of the normal experience of living in this world. And everything is affected, including our work. So let's look at a few ways in which this does affect us. I want us to look at four ways in which this living under the curse and the judgment of God affects how we work in this world. Firstly, what we discover soon enough is that work that was once easy and pleasurable becomes toil. In fact, the passage says painful toil. Let me read again from Genesis chapter 3. To Adam, God said, Because you listened to your wife and ate the fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, there's the phrase, you will eat the food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for, to dust, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. So what happens now is although work is intrinsically good, our experience of it is very different. Our experience of work day to day, week to week, is in fact something, instead of being uh, something that comes easily or that we love to do, uh, it takes a toll on us. It becomes hard. In fact, even finding work becomes hard. And maybe you're in that position today. And even when we find a job that is just the right fit for who we are, you know, it's perfect for how we are wired and the gifts we have, it still ends up being hard a lot of the time. There are very few people who jump out of bed eager to go to work on a Monday morning. You may be one of them, but you are a rare breed. Most of us find it hard to go to work. On a... It's why we talk about working for the weekends. It's why we say things like, Thanks, thank God it's Friday, because work is tough. Even those who are happiest in their jobs and who say they love their work still have to take breaks from their work in order not to burn out. So work is hard to do. It's also hard on those who do it. It takes its toll on families and relationships. In many homes, work has sort of torn at the very fabric of the family. We have moms who would love to stay at home with their young children who can't, or who return to work early out of necessity. Dads who get home from work late every evening and who miss much of their children's development. Saturdays that used to be mandatory rest days have become a time now where we just veg out and sleep and try and catch up instead of being creative and productive. Work makes it hard to do even the things that we know we should do, like eat well and sleep well and exercise. Work is toil. 
And the reason that it is toil, verse 17 tells us, is because the ground is cursed. And if you're a farmer or a botanist or a landscaper, you know very well that the ground is cursed. It's not easy. But of course, everything is cursed. The financial markets are cursed. The delivery structures are cursed. The transport systems are cursed. It's all under the judgment of God. You know, they say, find a job that you love, and you'll never work a day in your life. It's just not true, though, is it? Because by the sweat of your brow, verse 19 says, you will eat your food until you return to the dust from which you came. Work is toil. Secondly, related to this, work is frustrating. Work is frustrating. Verse 18 says that the ground will produce thorns and thistles for you. Uh, Using this metaphor of, of us as gardeners, the passage tells us that as we go about this gardening, what we're going to find is that not only do the plants that we plant grow up, but these thorns and these thistles frustrate us all the time. Nothing comes easy. Often it seems that everything is against us. Even the smallest tasks can sometimes seem impossible to get done. You, know, you come up with a great idea or you come up with a great product or a great campaign only for it to hit one roadblock after another. And even if you manage to get through all of those things and you get the product or the campaign out there, there's this unforeseen setback that then pulls the rug out from underneath you. It is frustrating, isn't it? Uh, Or as Ecclesiastes reflects on it in the passage that was read, you know, you you build up this wonderful business and then you, you leave it to somebody else who doesn't care at all for the business and it just falls apart in a generation. In fact, the book of Ecclesiastes is very helpful to us here because the writer reflects and wrestles with this frustration of life as he puts it under the sun. That is, life as we live it in this world, this broken world. And what he says is that that life lived in this world is like the morning mist. You know, I don't know if it was yesterday or the day before, as I was driving through Durbanville, there was just this thick mist over everything. And then half an hour later, it was gone. You know, you look at it, you couldn't even see, see through it, and then it's gone. And he says, that's kind of what life is like here. Everything that we think might be permanent becomes transitory and fleeting. So look what he says in verse 22 of chapter 2. The writer says, What do people gain for all the toil and the anxious striving which with, with, with which they labor under the sun? All their days, all their work rather, is grief and pain. Even at night their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. That's the word that is like vapor. Whatever you manage to do in this world is fleeting. It slips out of your hand just as easily or just as quickly as the morning mist is gone. So our big goals and our big career aspirations always seem just a little bit out of reach. You know, they talk about a midlife crisis, which sort of affects people my age. And, uh, and what it is, it's a very real experience, is you, you get to a point, and there's a few things that contribute to it, but one of the big things is you get to a point in your life where you look back And you realize you haven't done all of the things that you hoped you'd do. All of the things you'd hoped you'd achieved, you still haven't done them. And it doesn't look like you're going to do them. Work is frustrating. And you realize that even the things that are most important to us, often we can't keep a handle on. So look at chapter 4 of Ecclesiastes and this very sad picture. The writer says, Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. Here's a guy who perhaps has invested his whole life in, as he thinks of it, looking after his family. And all that's happened is that he's lost his family because he's neglected them. Work is frustrating. Thirdly, work is selfish. It is filled with people who are selfish. And the activities of work are often marked by selfishness. Instead of me working to serve my neighbor, what I end up doing is working to serve myself. And so the workplace is full of corruption and injustice and favoritism. Somebody steals an idea that you had. Somebody claims credit for work that you've done or pushes past you to get a promotion that you deserved. Now, where does all of this come from? Well, it comes from the very beginning, from Adam and Eve. In fact, just a few chapters on from the Adam and Eve story, we read the just as tragic story of the Tower of Babel, which is really the the downward spiral, you know, gone to the nth degree, where human beings decide that they are now going to make a name for themselves. 
They can leave God out of the picture altogether. And, and this is what we read in Genesis 11. Then they, that's the people, said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. You know, if ever there was a motto for our working world today, it's this, let's make a name for ourselves. That's what drives people, isn't it? It's no wonder that the workplace is full of mistrust. We can't trust our clients to pay. We can't trust our suppliers to deliver. We need to secure everything with contracts and negotiations and deposits. And in the process, we become suspicious of others, don't we? Ecclesiastes chapter 4 again. And I saw that all toil and all achievement spring from one person's envy of another. How's that for an indictment? True. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Which means, fourthly, that as we live under the, the curse of this world, we experience work as fairly pointless. It seems to be pointless anyway. Chapter 2, verse 17 of Ecclesiastes, the writer says, So I hated life, because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. When the dust settles on all our effort and our toil, it does seem so unfulfilling and so unsatisfying, doesn't it? And we ask ourselves, what was the point? What is the point? You know, many people uh, end up working their whole lives in a kind of job that is mindless and mundane. You know, you think of the factory worker on that assembly line, just doing one thing repeatedly, day after day, week after week, for the rest of their lives. But it's not just the low-level worker who experiences this. Somebody who's qualified could sit in front of a computer day after day, spreadsheet after spreadsheet, or teach you know, class after class of children who really don't get it, and you say, well, what is the point? You know, when we walk into a new job, often it starts with that sort of sense of anticipation. This time we think, I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to use my job to contribute in some meaningful way to this world. But before long, we're back at our old habits and we're seeing people all around us either as allies or enemies. And we have to keep one step ahead of them. And so what often happens, of course, as work seems to be pointless, is we stop living for the work, we live for the weekend. Or we live for the pleasure that money can buy. Or we live for the holidays. See, we are broken. Our world is broken. Our colleagues are broken. Our systems are broken. It is all under the judgment of God. As the Bible says, creation is groaning. Well, this has been very encouraging. I'm sure you're very glad you came this morning and that you're wondering why on earth I got out of bed to be told all that I already know about work. Thank you. I'm going to work tomorrow. <laughs> Stick with me. Because if we're going to work well in this broken world, we have to start with real honesty, brutal honesty about the way it is. We can't play pretend. But, now here's the key thing, but the original intent of God for work to be good and purposeful remains. And so I want us to think now how we can make the best of work in a world that is broken and spend the last few minutes thinking about four ways in which we can work well in a broken world. Firstly, working well in a broken world means at least this. It means firstly having a balanced perspective. I want to say a biblical perspective. See, on the one hand, we know that God is good and that he has designed work for good, with a good purpose. But on the other hand, as we've just seen, we know that there is brokenness and curse around us. So what we've got to do is hold these two realities in tension. One of the problems is we often end up at one of two extremes. We either become idealists, right, thinking that we really can change the world and make a huge difference and leave our mark, and we end up being disillusioned. And it's great to have op optimism, but our world is broken. So we don't want to be an idealist, but we could also be a cynic at the other extreme. Maybe you used to be an idealist, and then you know, all of the reality of this life hits you in the, it, right in the face, and now you're just a cynic. And the cynic simply says, well, it's all a waste of time. Nothing ever changes. I'm just going to live for myself. But you see, having the Bible's perspective holds both of these things in tension. God is good. 
There is a good design to work. There is purpose to work. There is meaning to work. At the same time, we live with the frustration of a world under the curse of God. And again, Ecclesiastes is helpful here because it, it surprisingly offers a note of hope and how we might proceed living like this. After the bleak assessment of all that the writer sees, you know, it's all meaningless, it's all a waste of time, he then says, surprisingly, in chapter 2, verse 24, at the end of the passage that was read, should be chapter 2, not chapter 4, just on the screen, it says this, a person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God, for without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? In other words, there is enjoyment to be had, even though it is fleeting. There is satisfaction to be found, even though before long it'll be gone. So what do we do? Well, find the enjoyment you can. Find the satisfaction that there is to find in the work that you do. But don't forget that it is fleeting. And don't ever forget the one who gives the enjoyment of work in the first place. As the passage says, without him, who can eat or find any enjoyment? We have to keep our eyes fixed on the one who designed work in the first place. Do you see the realism here? This is the kind of perspective that is very rare out in the workplace. There is enjoyment, there is purpose, there is meaning, but at the same time there is, there is the limitation of living under the curse. So there's this balance. Secondly, and maybe most important as we live in a fallen world, we must learn to trust the God who can. What I mean by that, the God who can and who does the things that we can't. You see, when we're faced with our own limitations and the frustrations and the failures of our work, we need to know that only God gets it right all the time. And he does get it right all the time. He completes every task. He achieves every goal. He meets every deadline. He never misses a deadline. His work is always perfect and exactly according to his original intent. And that, friends, is freeing. Because we can't be God, and we don't have to be God. And knowing our limitations in this broken world is essential if we're going to cope with those difficulties that we will inevitably face. We can't do the impossible. In fact, we often can't do the thing we want to do that isn't impossible. But we don't have to do more than we are able to do. There is only one God who is sovereign and who is all-powerful, and it is not us. And so we need to look to him. We need to trust him. And strangely enough, then what we find is we actually can be used by God in whatever circumstances he's placed us in. You see, as we start to realize that God is all-powerful, that we are limited, we can start to say, well, okay, in that case, what small positive change can I make to this broken world where I find myself? How could God use me here and allow me to be faithful to him here? Thirdly, and related to this, we have to learn to see with the eyes of faith. You see, knowing that there is this all-powerful working God behind the scenes of history who is always doing something good through the mess of our brokenness actually gives great significance to what we do. Because it means that even when everything perhaps looks like it's falling apart or we're stuck in a rut or we're in some sort of financial crisis or our clients and our staff are making life miserable, God is still on the throne, and he's still working out his purposes. Remember, he never clocks out. He is always working to his purposes and plans. And what are his purposes and plans for us? Well, we can't go to a better verse, I don't think, than Romans 8, 28, the verse I'm sure you know well, which gives us this wonderful assurance. And we know, it says, that in all things, God works, there's the word, works, what is he working for? He works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. God is at work for good. What is that good? Well, this is not just a blank check verse where we can plug in whatever good we think God should be doing in our lives. Notice the good that God is doing is to make us, to make you more like Jesus. And all of the frustrations and the hardships and the toil and everything else that comes with working in this world is being used by God to that end. Isn't that wonderful? 
And so if you find yourself frustrated and disheartened, and you're in a job and you're wondering, you know, maybe I should leave, first stop and say, well, what is God doing in this situation? And how is he calling me to be salt and light here? How is God calling you to trust him? How is God exposing your idols? You know, that's often what happens, isn't it, as we come up against frustrations. The things that we get angry about or anxious about or frustrated about are very often the idols that we're chasing after, and God is unveiling those to us. So let's pray that God would show us where those idols are and would help us to trust him to do good in our situation. As lastly, and here's the last thing we need to do, as lastly, we look forward to a world made whole. See, working in a broken world means we have to strain forward towards the world, the world that God is making, the renewal of all things, because God is bringing wholeness and healing to all of his creation. The brokenness of work should stir us to strain forward toward what God is doing and what he promises to do one day. Whenever you've looked at your job and you've said, this can't be how it's supposed to be, that's exactly right. This isn't how it's supposed to be. God has made work to be good all of the time. And so we should strain forward towards the promise that one day that'll be the case. And the wonderful message of the Bible, of course, is that's what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to redeem all of creation. Jesus went to the cross to deal with the root cause of all of our pain, to deal with the curse, to take upon himself the curse of this broken world permanently so that he could bring blessing back to this world forever. He died to bring rest, to arrest this world. As we saw in the, the verse that um, Alan read to us, let's just have a look at it one more time. In Matthew t- chapter 11, where Jesus says to us, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, wonderful. Jesus toiled so that our toil can come to an end. And this is not just an offer for the future. This can start now as we put our trust in him. We have a Savior who offers rest. And my question simply to you is, have you found your rest in him? Whatever your working situation, maybe you're not working, maybe you're working in a terrible situation, or maybe somewhere in between, have you found your rest in Jesus? Let's pray together. Oh Lord, we thank you today that in the midst of the brokenness of a world under your judgment, there is hope. Thank you that you've called us to live in such a way that, that points people and, and directs people towards what you are doing through the Lord Jesus Christ in bringing hope and renewal and meaning and purpose. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you went to the cross, offering up your life in our place so that we might be set free. As we come to your table, as we remember uh, the Lord's death on our behalf, as we celebrate communion, help us, Lord, to be strengthened in our faith and to leave this place a little bit later with a renewed sense of what you are doing in us and through us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.